as the elders talked, we decided we'd keep with the theme of the church, walking in truth and love. But what we decided to do was take an overview of the book of Acts. Uh, so we're going to cover 28 chapters in five weeks. Okay, so you're going to have to buckle up and um, you know, get your airbag engaged because there's going to be some places where we're going to stop suddenly, camp on that. But the reality is that if you want to know what the church is like, and you want to know what the purpose of the church is, you've got to start with the book of Acts. The book of Acts was written by Luke. Luke was a doctor, he was a historian, and the book of Luke and the book of Acts are basically volume one, volume two of church history. And I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 24, and I'll show you how it ends, and then we'll look at the book of Acts in just a little bit, and then chapter 1. So when we're done there, you can go ahead and turn to chapter 1 of the book of Acts. But Luke chapter 24, Jesus Christ has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He's shown himself to his disciples. And there's a transition being made now while he's spending time with them. He's, he's preparing to ascend into heaven. And so he writes these things um, in verse 45, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. That's really important. And Luke is giving us a commentary on what Jesus is doing. And you'll find that throughout the book of Acts. So here, there's these little commentary spots where Luke, the historian, makes like this temporary parenthesis and says, All right, let me explain to you what's going on. And so what he did here was he helped us understand that the disciples didn't get it until Jesus opened their minds. Verse 46, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ, he's speaking of himself, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the, promised, the promise of the Father upon you, that would be the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city, that would be Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. And so Luke ends volume one, and then we go to volume two, the book of Acts, chapter one. And we find that the purpose of the book of Acts is stated in the first eight chapters. Now, as we, as we get prepared to, to um, read the first uh, eight verses, I mean, the first eight verses, um, understand that there's a lot of material out there written by the experts on church growth. If you do these three things, you do these six things, if, if you get your people to run the bases, your church will grow. Yeah, but why? Why will it grow? Uh, on what foundation is it growing? Um, so we, we need to look no further than the scriptures if we're going to understand what church growth is, why it should happen, how it should happen, what does it look like. So we just have to look at the scriptures. And so in Acts chapter 1, uh, Luke lays out for us in the first eight verses what the, the premise for church growth is. So verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, that's the same person he was writing the book of Luke to. We don't know who that is. Um, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up and after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after uh, his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, 
but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said. You heard from me, for John the Baptist, um, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom to Israel? They didn't get it. Did you see where he's going and where they went? He's going eternal. They're only looking at the here and now. They're only looking at the physical. And they missed it. So what does he say? He doesn't answer the question. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other, in other words, you asked the wrong question. A good questioner asks right questions. They didn't. They were, they were diverting. They were derailing the conversation. So he brings them back on. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Mission of the church stated. You will be my witnesses. Mission of the church, not restoration of, of Israel. I understand that. I'm not anti-Israel. Mission of the church, not restoration of Israel. Mission of the church, evangelism of the lost. That's the mission of the church. Evangelism of the lost. And, and uh, Jesus clearly states that at the end of Luke, and he clearly states it at the beginning of Acts. It's always been the goal of Jesus Christ that his church would grow and spread around the world. From the beginning, that's been his goal. And there's a distinct and necessary method uh, by which this would uh, be accomplished. And Luke, the doctor, tracks this for us through the book of Acts. And he, he presents to us the spread of the gospel um, in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the way the book of A Acts is laid out. So in our introductory lesson today from Acts chapter 1 through Acts chapter 6 verse 7, uh, we're going to find out that the church in Jerusalem had some very important things to learn and some very important things happened in the church in Jerusalem that define what a godly church looks like, what a biblical church looks like. So the title of the sermon series always starts with a gospel-driven church. And there's a lot of things that drive churches today. Some are driven by purpose. Some are driven by seekers. Some are driven by all kinds of other things. But the thing that ought to drive the church is the gospel. That's the only message that Jesus gave to the disciples. The, the word has to go out to call people to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ. So our very first point, we're going to go through a lot of verses. Um, all but one, I think, is in the book of Acts. And that will be the very last verse, not in the book of Acts. So you can just stay right in the first six chapters of the book of Acts with me. A gospel-driven church grows properly by boldly preaching Christ, crucified, buried, and risen again, calling people to repentance. That's a gospel-driven church. There's a lot, of go, a lot of what goes on today in the pulpits across America is not gospel-driven, it's moralism-driven. We want lost people to live like Christians without calling them to repent of sinful lifestyles. If you learn how to budget, if you learn how to give, if you learn how to discipline your children, if you learn how to communicate well, all those things are really good. But lost people need Jesus. That's it. Lost people need Jesus. Then you learn how to communicate well. Then you learn the purpose of giving. Then you learn the purpose of disciplining your children. But without that, all you're doing is helping people to go to hell nicer. That's all you're doing. Moralism misses the mark. The gospel hits the mark. So gospel-driven churches grow because they first and foremost introduce people on a consistent and regular basis 
introduce people to Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again, ascending to the Father. His plan was for the church to spread throughout the world. That's always been the plan. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 1, we've got Jesus ascending into heaven. Uh, it's kind of humorous. Jesus ascends, the people are going, he disappears in the cloud, they keep looking up. The angel steps by and says, what are you looking up there for? He went away, he's going to come back the same way. Now, run along. Kind of what he says. And so they, they go up into the upper room, and some cool things happen in chapter 2 after they've gone into the upper room the Spirit of God descends on them as they're praying, and um, they do miraculous things like speaking in different languages and so that the people there are evangelized. There's a whole list of people in Acts chapter 2 that are evangelized and because they hear them speaking in their own language. And then Peter stands up, the spokesman for the church, stands up, and he addresses the crowd, and he addresses the crowd boldly. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, and we don't have time to hit every verse along the way, or we would never be out here in my throat. It certainly wouldn't hold up for that. Um, but we're going to hit the highlights in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. This Jesus, part of Peter's sermon, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. In other words, here's your definition of foreknowledge. Did God just look down the road and see that Jesus was going to be crucified? No. Foreknowledge means he actually planned it ahead of time. He was intimately involved in the process that, that took Jesus to earth and had him crucified at the right time by the right people, and, and there was no mistake about it. Foreknowledge doesn't leave it up to the whims of people. Foreknowledge means that God is intimately and actively involved in the moments. So if we're going to define foreknowledge, because that's, that's going to help you understand the doctrine of election, that's going to help you understand the doctrines of sovereign grace, if you don't understand the word foreknowledge, you're going to miss it. Prognosco, to know beforehand. But God knows everything and he's intimately involved because it says in your text that it was the definite plan and foreknowledge. So God, being sovereign, planned this event and was involved in history before it ever happened. So according to the definite plan of God and foreknowledge of God, you crucified. So you've got divine action and human responsibility. God planned it, but you carried it out. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Peter makes us really understand here human responsibility. Yeah, it was a plan of God, but you did it, and you're responsible for it. You've got a hundred questions going on in your mind about sovereignty right now. We're not going to touch them. We'll talk about them more, and if you hang around here much, you're going to understand sovereignty is a big issue for us. But look at the result of this. This bold speaking, this confrontational speaking led to Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. He's not saying, save yourselves eternally by doing a bunch of good works. He's saying, separate yourself from all these people going to hell. How do you do that? Well, as God draws you, you, you want nothing else but to separate yourself from them. So save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And it's not a, a coincidence that there's specific order here. Receiving the word means that you have to have this cognitive ability to uh, receive Jesus Christ as Savior. 
Not because you dreamed up the opportunity, but because God draw you to that point where you could make a conscious decision to choose Jesus Christ. Why'd you choose him? Because he already chose you. God, he chose you so that you would choose him, and you did that cognitive thing of humbling yourself before God. And the natural consequence of a person who's born again is that they want to follow the Lord in baptism. There's not a, a, any, any reference in the New Testament outside of the thief on the cross of a Christian not being baptized. Every Christian is baptized. Every Christian. You don't get baptized and become a Christian. You become a Christian and get baptized, and then you're added to the church, meaning there's got to be this church membership, this, this recognition of who's part of the church and who's not. So there was receive Christ, get baptized, be added to the church. It's part of church history, and it's part of the book of Acts. We'll see that as we go along here. So the first thing about a, a gospel-driven church is that it boldly preaches Christ crucified, buried, and risen again, calling people to repentance. The second thing we find is that a gospel-driven church grows properly by emphasizing generosity and compassion toward, toward believers. The very first place generosity should take place is within the body of Christ, within the family of God. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Acts 2, 42 to 47. we find in verse 41 they received the word they were baptized now we, we they were added to the church now verse 42 to 47 and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayers and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributed them to the distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And notice what happened. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we've got this massive conversion on the day of Pentecost of 3,000 souls coming to Jesus Christ. Then as the church continues to meet together, as they are generous toward one another and they make sure that there's no needs within the church body, then more people are seeing that and they're going, hey, we don't see this in the Roman world. We don't even see this from the Pharisees and the Jews. This is something totally cool because um, many of these people were slaves, many of these people were poor, and there was generosity here. And more and more people saw that and were added to the church. And one of the ways people see that Christians are different is because Christians ought to be generous. The, the mark of Christians ought to be generosity. We ought, to, we ought to be the kind of people who, who open the wallet, open the home, open the refrigerator, open the car doors, and help people out. That's, that ought to be the trait of Christians. Unfortunately, in our busy lifestyles and our busy world, we tend to be too busy to help people, and that ought not be. Verse 47, they were praising God. They, they, they weren't all, all, you know, you want my money again? They weren't doing that. They were praising God, and they were having favor with all the people. And because of that, the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. So a gospel-driven church grows properly by emphasizing generosity and compassion toward believers. A gospel-driven church, third, grows properly when the leaders speak boldly about the resurrected Christ, even though some may be offended. The, the, the seeker movement today wants to create a church atmosphere by which unsaved people are not offended at the gospel. That's no longer the gospel. Because the gospel is necessarily offensive. Who wants to hear, you're a big fat sinner? You'll go to hell if you don't repent. Who, who, wants, who woke up this morning and said, I want somebody to tell me that? Nobody does. Our pride doesn't want anybody seeing us as sinners. 
as falling short, as missing the mark. And yet, the, the thing that's going to help us the most is a recognition of how far we've fallen short. The foolishness of the cross, it is offensive. It's foolish to miss to those who are perishing. Acts chapter 3, before we get to Acts chapter 4, it's not in your, your notes, but Acts chapter 3, if you'll take a look at, Acts, at verse 17 to the first part of verse 20, and, and it goes on. But Acts 3, 17 through just the first part of verse 20. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. And here's Peter preaching again. Um, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Look at verse 19. Repent, therefore. You acted foolishly. You actually crucified the Savior. But there's good news. Even that can be forgiven. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Ah, what a great news, you know. You can imagine when you find out that you crucified the Messiah, the, the very one that the prophets have been foretelling, you actually had a hand in crucifying. And now what are you going to do? Because you have the wrath of God Almighty on you, and you're, you know that you are going to burn eternally in hell, and then somebody comes along and says, hey, it was the plan of God. And there's forgiveness. All you need to do is repent and turn from your sin to doing right by the power and grace of God, and times of refreshing will come. There's nothing like restored relationships. Broken relationships, they're, they're garbage. Any of you have broken relationships? Okay, we, we all have them. They're garbage. It's just, it's horrible. You, you end up becoming bitter. You end up becoming angry, or somebody's bitter at you, angry at you. And there's nothing better than someone making full confession and saying, I messed up. I'm the problem here. I sinned. And your sin was probably just a reaction to my sin. Will you please forgive me? I, I want our relationship restored. And, and think about this from God's perspective. He never sinned. He looks at us and said, you sinned. But guess what? I want to forgive you anyway. And all you have to do is humble yourself. That's the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is not, hey, God loves everybody. He's angry with the wicked every day. The question you have to ask is, if you're not in Christ, do you want him to be angry with you every day? Or would you rather have him in love with you every day? Because he loves his children. He's angry with the wicked every day, and he punishes sin. And the message of the gospel is, changes lives not because we make it appealing to people not because we we soften it up um, lost people go to hell eternally jesus christ died to save lost people look at chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 and as they were speaking to the people the priests and the captain of the temple and the sadducees came upon them and and they were overjoyed is that what it says? No, it says they were greatly annoyed. Why would the message of repentance and getting right with God annoy people? Because it annoys those who have blind eyes and deaf ears to the things of God. And we can't make it palatable to them. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Wouldn't you think that'd give people hope? They arrested them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Look at verse, uh, that, that fourth verse again. They're standing up, they're proclaiming this. The officials come along and say, you can't talk like that. That good news stuff's got to go. 
you know, we, we, we want Jesus dead, we want him buried, we want him to stay there. And this message of Jesus Christ rising from the dead, giving people hope, we can't have any of that. So we're going to arrest you, we're going to put you in jail. And other people stand around going, hey, that doesn't make sense. Arresting people for giving hope. And they end up believing, and now the number grows to about 5,000 men, not counting the women. So it was so, if we just want to do the, the women children thing, you've you got a church somewhere of around 10,000 people so far. I mean, this thing's growing massively under persecution. And it, it grows because it's not about not making the gospel offensive. It's about loving people enough to offend them. A gospel-driven church grows properly when believers pray together and are filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a missing ingredient in our churches today, that this, this idea of praying together and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think that what we think about prayer tends to reflect on our personal relationship with the living God. Chapter 4, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place where they gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. If you want to really be a proclaimer of the Word of God, you can't do it in your flesh because this is spirit work. And if, if a church is really going to be reaching people for Christ and really growing the way that God is glorified, it takes spirit-filled leaders proclaiming boldly the word of God, calling people to repent so that a church is not filled with people who like to hear a fuzzy gospel, but the church is filled with people who've repented of sins and have been baptized and committed to serving Jesus Christ and living for Him and repenting of sin on a continual daily basis and turning back to the Lord and serving Him daily and sacrificing. It's, it's, a, it's a church that's on fire for Christ. Not a church that has all kinds of activities going, but a church where the Spirit of God is active. They continue to speak the Word of God with boldness. Gospel-driven church grows properly when believers refuse to be selfish. Before we look at Acts 4.32, I want to go back to Acts 2, verses 44 and 45, and, and just read those again to you. Acts 2, 44 to 45. This is the, the brand new church. I mean, a day, a week, a month old. You don't know how long it is here, but, but it's brand new. And there's 3,000 people in this church. And, and all who believed were together. That means they made the commitment to be together. And, they, and you find out later on, they met not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, they met every day together. That's how in love with the Lord they were. They had, the believers had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the, pr the proceeds to all as any had need. What a great testimony of selfless believers, a transformed heart that's selfless. Acts 4, verse, thir verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. How transforming would that be if we held loosely the things that God has given us and we stopped hoarding them and holding them as if they were ours alone? And we opened our doors and we opened our refrigerators and we opened our wallets to those who have need. The gospel driven church grows properly when sin is dealt with. Up to this point, 
outside of Peter being arrested and some of the other uh, apostles being arrested for preaching, it's been pretty peaceful. But now we've got our first sign of internal trouble. There's sin in the church now. This whole attitude of, wait a second, I don't want to give the whole thing, now creeps in. And, and you find that all these people were selling pieces of property and they were bringing the money to the, to the apostles and laying it at the apostles' feet for the apostles to distribute to the poor. And Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of property and they connived together. They said, wait a second, you know, all these people, they're bringing everything, but I really don't feel like doing that. So here's what we'll do. Let's sell it for such and such a price, and then we'll pretend that, we're going to hold some of that back, and we're going to pretend like we gave all the amount. See, their, their problem wasn't that they held some back. Their problem was they lied about it. They pretended to be sacrificially giving, and they didn't. And notice what happened here. Acts 5, verse 3. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Now, the issue isn't the keeping back of the proceeds. The issue is the lie. I'm a sacrificial giver. And we sold this property for X, and here's all the money. And pretending to be something that they're not. Well, at the news, Ananias dies. Done for. I've often wondered how our offerings would change Right? If we if we were really honest about why we don't give. Or if we were really honest about why we give what we give. Verse 9. They, 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 those young men take Ananias out, they bury him. Didn't need an autopsy, God did it. And Peter said to her, this is Sapphira when she comes in. How is it that you've agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Because he's already asked her, have you and your husband agreed for this and this amount? Yeah. And then he asked this question, how is it that you agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? And now it's not just lying to the Holy Spirit, it's a violation of a command to not put the Lord your God to the test. Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Done. Verse 11 is a natural consequence of that. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard about these things. I guess so. Right? God doesn't work that way necessarily today. But if he did, would it change what we did? The gospel-driven church grows properly when sin is dealt with, and the gospel-driven church grows properly when the sick are cared for. Verse 14. Verses 14 and 15. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Uh, Peter was a man walking with God. He was a man that the people knew was in step with God, and we want to get close to him. We want to be around him. We want him, even his shadow, to affect us. And this is early church, and God's establishing his church. He's establishing the authority of the apostles. 
And so this miraculous event that the Apostle Paul had where as he walked by, his shadow would be on some and they would be healed, that doesn't happen today. It was for the establishment of the church and the validation of the church. Lots of the miracles in the book of Acts were, were simply for the validation of the church. That's why the Gentiles spoke in tongues to validate that they had the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, how would you know they had him? So there's a lot of validation going on. And, and, but they knew Peter was the spokesman for the church. They knew that he was the one, the head of the twelve, the, the leader among the equals. Verse 16. The people also gathered from the towns in, around Jerusalem bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Again, we're not promoting healing ministries, but I do think that the principle of caring for the sick is a church principle. We, we ought to be the ones, as Christians, redeeming the social works from the world because all they're going to do is make them healthy on their way to hell. And when the Christian church the true church redeems the social works from the world, we not only heal the body, but we give them the good news that heals the soul. And we deal with the whole person as a person because really, people aren't just spirit and soul. Until they die, there's a body that goes along with that, right? And that body is subject to decay, subject to illness, subject to hurts and pains. And the church ought to be there to minister in those areas. So, so we need to think bigger than meeting on Sunday. And that's a gospel-driven church, and we use all these avenues of meeting the needs within the church, presenting the gospel to lost people, uh, meeting the needs of the sick, distributing to the poor. We have all these, these social things that the church was involved in, and in the early church, that the, the true Christian church has kind of because we've done a knee-jerk reaction to the social gospel, we've, we've re neglected to minister to the hurts, the physical hurts of people. People really do hurt. People really are in pain. People really knew, do need a Christian to come along and minister to them, to pray with them, to pray for them, to, to read scripture to them, to, to be Christ's hands and feet to them. Now, that's, our, that's our responsibility as Christians. So up to this point, all the ministry has been done by the twelve, the apostles. There's been a, a new twelfth since Judas hung himself. Matthias has been appointed so that there are twelve now again. So now we move to a new thing in chapter 6. We find that a, a gospel-driven church grows properly when it's organized biblically. And there's great pains taken to, to describe to us what this organization looked like. Up to this point, the church is a minimum of 10,000 people for 12 disciples, 12 apostles, right? Right? So that's somewhere around 1,000 each they have to minister to. You're not going to get a house call from them. You can't do it. There's not enough time in a day. A growing church has too many needs for elders to meet alone. And when a gospel church grows, it grows by new converts. New converts, baby Christians, need to be discipled. Discipled by who? By the elders? Well, if it's growing and the people are doing their work, then it's going to be growing too fast for the elders to be able to do their job. We'll come to Acts chapter 6, verse 1. We'll read these words. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, we keep hearing this, this ramping up from 3,000 added day by day, 5,000, more and more attitude added, great multitudes added, both men and women. we got this, this burgeoning church that is too big for 12 guys to take care of.
<clears throat> how it goes. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose. All of a sudden, there's dissatisfaction in the flock. The Hellenists were complaining against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. What are Hellenists? Jews who spoke Greek. During the Babylonian captivity, not everyone went to Babylon, not everyone stayed in Jerusalem, but there was a diaspora, a dispersion that took place. And, and some of the Jewish people went to other countries. And these Hellenist Jews learned Greek. They didn't speak very, very good Aramaic. So there was murmuring against the Hebrew Jews who spoke Aramaic. They were Palestinian Jews. And you've got this language barrier in the church. Church is growing, and, and as it should be, it's cross-cultural. There's, there's cultural boundaries, there's uh, language barriers, and, and yet it still grows as one church. And somehow, the Hellenistic Jewish widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. The question is, who's distributing it? The answer is the twelve. The twelve were doing the distribution. We find that the primary responsibility of elders is prayer and ministry of the word. The primary responsibility of elders is prayer and the ministry of the word. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, they weren't minimizing the daily distribution of food. What they were saying is, the church is growing too big. Not that we've got to go plant other churches. That's not the purpose here. It's not, it's not in a panic of, it's too big. Nobody knows each other in this church. This is a common argument against big churches. We don't know each other. It was about ten to 15,000 people. It, was, it wasn't too big, and we need to start another church. It was too big for 12 to take care of. And if the 12 were going to distribute the food to the poor, they wouldn't have any time for their prayer time and for the study and ministry of the Word. And the purpose of the statement is not, we've got to start new churches. The purpose of the statement was, we've got to get more men involved. Because up to this point, it's just been the apostles up to this point, it's just been the 12 doing this wonderful ministry. Verse 4 of chapter 6, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's the primary purpose of the apostle elders, the elders that they had uh, who were the 12 apostles. More, uh, more elders were appointed later. We get into that, and we've gotten into that um, in our study through Titus. Warren Wiersbe made this statement. I thought it was really good. The apostles knew that their primary ministry was prayer and the word of God. If local churches would allow their pastors to obey Acts 6-4, we would see increase in spiritual power and in numbers. It's interesting that many churches expect the elders to do the work and the, the members to be fed without feeding each other. So what was the answer? The answer was the church must select men who meet a strict criterion, who can, who can be appointed by the elders for the protection of the unity of the church. A big statement there, but what, you, what I want you to get is it, deacons, that's what we're going to be looking at, deacons weren't just, hey, just, just you, you seven guys, come on over here. There was a strict criterion by which these men were picked. Uh, Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men 
of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Three things we can, we can uh, draw out of this. First of all, the, the deacons, though the word deacon isn't used here, um, the idea of duty and ministry are forms of the word that is diakonos, the word deacon. They have to have a good reputation. These men must have nothing in their life that, was per, that would permanently disqualify them from this position as leaders in the church, servants in the church. So they have to have a good reputation. Two, these men must be full of the Holy Spirit. They have to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why do you need to be full of the Holy Spirit to wait on tables? Obviously, there's more to the ministry than just waiting on tables. And three, these men must be full of wisdom. Um, whether that is who gets the distribution or whether that is ministering to them to put down the murmurings, the complainings, somehow these men had to be wise. They had to have some kind of biblical wisdom that would allow them to meet the needs of the people. And then we go back to Acts 6, 1. Now in these days when the disciples uh, were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So what can we learn about the deacons? Number one, these men must be the primary caregivers of the church taking care of widows. They're the primary caregivers in the church. Two, these men must be the primary agents for unity in the church with their wisdom. When you talk with a deacon, wisdom ought to exude out of him. It just ought to ooze out of him. He ought to be the kind of man who's able to answer your, your issue, answer your question, answer your problem with some truly wise biblical counsel. And three, these men must be the primary distributors to the poor in the church. A growing church ought to have poor people in it. It ought to have people who have wealth as well. It ought to be uh, a mix of all um, uh, stages of, of financial uh, wealth and poorness. Again, Warren Wiersbe said the deacon's main task was to take care of the material needs and thus relieve the apostles for their spiritual ministry. So uh, one of the things that we've, we've discussed as elders is on Wednesday nights for about the next month, we're going to take a break on a Roman series. We're going to talk about what, what it is that qualifies a man to be a deacon because we'd like to add to the number of deacons that we have. And so we're going to, we're going to take a, about a four-week, uh, with a couple of breaks in there, four-week um, lesson on deacons. Because it's important for the deacons to be men who meet these qualifications. And so um, four weeks and then uh, the members are going to be able to select or uh, uh, suggest some men whom they think might be fit for being deacons. A gospel-driven church grows properly when these two offices function in unity. They ought to be working together. It's not that the deacons against the elders, or the elders against the deacons, they ought to be working in unity so that the, the, the elders are given to prayer and the, the presentation of the, of the scriptures and the deacons are taking care of the, the needs of the people on an individual basis so that the pastors are free to take the word of God and, and take their time in prayer. Verse 7, and what happens? And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. One of the commentaries I read said there were at least 8,000 priests, Jewish priests in Jerusalem at the time uh, of, of um, this event. And most of them were very poor. And so dealing with the poor and ministering to the poor very appealing to the Jewish priests and opened their hearts to the gospel. And so we don't know what just ministering to the, 
the monetary and physical needs of people will do, but it will open the heart to the gospel. This word increased is the imperfect active, and it means to keep, it kept on, kept on growing all the more because the apostles were now relieved from the daily ministration of food. Didn't mean that the apostles didn't care about people. Just meant that they, they had a, a greater priority of prayer and ministry of the word. And one other commentary said, as a direct result of the preaching and teaching of the apostles, who could now devote themselves fully to prayer and the ministry of the word, more and more people believed and joined the church. That's a gospel-driven church. It ought to be growing. A gospel-driven church does not grow simply because the elders and deacons are doing their part, but requires that every member also does his or her part. The church isn't the elders and the deacons' church. It's everyone's church. It's the members' church. Another commentary made this statement. It does not necessarily follow that ministerial faithfulness, that means the faithfulness of those in leadership, will be attended with such results. Just because you've got godly leaders doesn't mean the church is going to grow. Prayerlessness or discord or inconsistency on the part of the members may defeat the exertions of the holiest and ablest minister of Christ. It's hard to grow a church when there's discontent in the family. Ephesians chapter 4 as we close. Ephesians 4. Paul, who came on later, made this statement about the, the function of the church in chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, that'd be all those in ministry, he gave them, that'd be Jesus Christ gave them, Verse 12, why did he give them? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. You all are ministers. Why should you minister? For the building up of the body of Christ. Why should we build up the body of Christ? Or how long should we do this? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we, are, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Everything we ought to do ought to be done for the glory of God and the building up of the church. That's, that's what Christ died for. In Ephesians chapter 5 says Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. But there's a proper function a gospel-driven church reaches lost people for Jesus Christ, meets the needs of poor, helps those who are sick, uh, has a proper function. And as we do that, the gospel goes out with a brighter light than it ever has. Father, I thank you for the time together today. I thank you that um, you are the great provider. Everything that we are and everything we have, we owe to you. We aren't worthy, first of all, for your salvation, but you loved us and gave your Son so that all who believe would be saved. We thank you, Father, for the grace of God that calls people to salvation and changes hearts and lives as we humble ourselves before you. And I thank you, Father, for the working of the Spirit of God in our, in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you're not done with your church. You haven't come back yet. Therefore, your church is still the tool by which the gospel goes out. And I pray, Father, that we'll be the best part of that body that we can be, fulfilling our role to the glory and grace of God. We love you, Father. 
We want to honor you. And I pray that if there's someone here who's never received Christ, that today would be the day of salvation, that they could be a part of the family of God. We'll thank you and glorify you in the name of Jesus.